Welcome back. This is Lecture 13, Part 1. And I want to pick up where we left off in our last class, and that is Ecclesiastes. And we're looking at this now. This is a unique book uh, because I don't think that most people even bother to treat it with any a theological veracity or any respect for that matter. And so we have another phrase that we use often, avoid the lust of youth. Avoid the lust of youth. Now that's a phrase you hear often in many different variations of it, but basically it comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, and we see it in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 10. So remove grief and anger from your heart and put away pain from your body because childhood and the prime life are fleeting. Childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. Notice that. We see uh, later on in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 says this. Now flee from your youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace and those who call the Lord from a pure heart. So we see this phrase, or the, or well, again, what we said in our last class, the doctrinal dependence of one book to the other, thus verifying it. We see it again in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 2, along with Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. We've heard the phrase, and we've used it many a times, where it says, death is divinely appointed. Death is divinely appointed. Everybody has an appointment with death. And we've heard different variations of this phrase, and it comes out of the book of Ecclesiastes. And once again, it's verified from the writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 9. So we look in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 2, and it says, A time to give birth and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. We see that concept here of, an, of a divinely appointed time of death, and we see it repeated in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, and inasmuch as it is appointed for man, he says this, to die once, and after this comes the judgment. Then we have another phrase that's used greatly in the church as well, in the church world, and that is, the love of money is evil. <clears throat> we see it a lot, and in, in fact today, uh, just yesterday, I uh, uh, briefly turned on the news, I rarely watched any kind of uh, television uh, of a lot of different programs, uh, I'm not a big person on that, uh, I find it most of it is a waste of time, or, um, and what I do watch is primarily is sports and is basically background noise for me. But yesterday I happened, to, <clears throat> I looked in the news and uh, to find out what, what, the, what exactly, t stick my head out the window to find out what's happening in the world. And here was a reporter relating a story, uh, and in the middle of the story, the reporter says, the love of money is evil. I go, wow, even, even the world understands that concept. Well, we get that out of Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. And Ecclesiastes 5, 10 says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. This is the reason why the rich get rich and the poor get poor. The rich is never satisfied. He always wants more. Um, in 1 Timothy, in chapter 6, verse 10, we see, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It says, it's the root of all sorts of kinds of evil, and, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So we see this phrase. Then we have um, another phrase, and I've heard this uh, particular, uh, and, and this is, uh, mostly I've heard this, um, it's, it's in the church world, but I've also heard it primarily around the dinner table, or have you ever gone to dinner with a bunch of preachers? You know, and that's usually, that's a, that's pretty a dicey, that's a dicey situation, right? Okay? Um, or you go to a, a, a preacher meeting, okay, and everybody wants to preach. It, it's just absolutely amazing. Nobody can get to the point. They all want to preach, and they all want to expound, and they all just want to go on and on. And I'm just convinced some people are just in love with their voice. But, you know, set that aside for the moment. And, and at the dinner table, I've heard this said by preachers when we get together, you know, and it says, don't be wordy in your prayer. Don't be wordy in your prayer. Have you heard that phrase? Well, <clears throat> I've heard that, you know, because some folks, they just go on and on and on and on. And I have to do it. I remember this as a child. My uncle, 
Uh, he was a real jokester, you know. And you know, and and people get together at the table, and they just want to go on and on and on. He took his fork, and when he would take the meat off of people's plate, put it on his plate, he'd be cutting it up, and he'd be eating while there, while there was this long-winded prayer going on. And so we had to learn, you know, that when you pray with one eye open, you pray and watch, pray and watch, because you know, my, if my uncle was at the table, your your piece of meat was gone. It was going to be gone. And so I want you to understand when you see this phrase or you hear this phrase, don't be wordy in your prayer. Well, we see this and, and Jesus uses this, this particular phrase um, with regard to our praying. We see this in Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2, where it says, Do not be hasty in word or impulse in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. He says, for God is in heaven and you on the earth, therefore let your words be few. Let your words be few. We see it when Jesus gives us instruction in the model prayer or the disciples prayer in Matthew chapter 6 verse 7. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many, many words. And here's the key to this. If these New Testament passages are truly doctrinally dependent on the teaching of the book of Ecclesiastes, then in fact the New Testament teaches or confirms the inspiration or the authority of the book of Ecclesiastes. Go to the book of the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon. Now, this book is not referred to directly in the New Testament, but there is at least one possible example of borrowing a descriptive phrase from this particular book, and we find that in the book of John in chapter 4, in verse 10. And that is, and here's the possible rendering for that, and it's a possible reference called to living water. It indicates possible, the, 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 the literary dependence possibly, okay, for the Song of Solomon. However, literary dependence alone is not a sufficient argument for the authority of this book, but it is Solomonic authorship would be, because we know that in, we see, we know that in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 1, okay, clearly Solomon is the author. And that alone gives it its own veracity. Now in John, in John 4.10 and Song of Solomon 4.15, notice what it says in, in, in Song of Solomon in 4.15. And now remember, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version, and I'll give it to you also in the King James Version because it's really not that difficult to remember. But this is what it says. It says, he says, you are a garden spring, a well, he says, of fresh water and streams flowing from Lebanon. In the King James, it says, a fountain of gardens, a well of living water, and streams from Lebanon. We see this reference in John chapter 4, where it says this in verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, now this is Jesus speaking, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. You remember the Samaritan woman at the well? Okay? And so here Jesus uses this phrase, okay, which is the only other place you're going to find it, and it's in the Song of Solomon. Let's go to the great book of Isaiah, the great book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, this book has numerous New Testament quotations. It's just all over the place in the New Testament. And John the Baptist is the one who introduces uh, Jesus by quoting the book of Isaiah in chapter 40, verse 3. Look at this. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, he says, For this is the one referred to by Isaiah, the prophet, when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. We see this in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, where it says, A voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Paul even prefaced this 
and he prefaced a quote in the book Isaiah, and we see this in, in the book of Acts, okay, where Paul uses this, right? And I want you to see this. In Acts chapter 28, verse 25, this is what Paul says. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul has spoken one parting word. This is what he said. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah, the prophet, to your fathers. We see this in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 9 and 10. And he said, go and tell his people. Go and tell his people. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to Isaiah. Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. So underscore, go and tell his people. And so you see that here, what you have is Paul prefaces his quote of Isaiah chapter 6. We also read in, this, in Isaiah chapter 61. In Isaiah chapter 61, at the end of that great book, in verses 1 and 2, he's in, he's, he finds himself in his hometown um, uh, synagogue. This is Jesus, right? And look at what he says in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me, underscore, the Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. And then he says in verse 2, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. In Luke, you remember, he enters his hometown synagogue, he walks in, he picks up the scroll, he reads it, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's a direct quote out of Isaiah chapter 61, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to proclaim release to the captives and, to reco and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now here Jesus verifies the book of Isaiah. How about the book of Jeremiah? Now Jeremiah, you will also discover, is quoted, okay, in the book of Matthew. So let's look at this together. And here's where we see for the very first time in the Old Testament, we see really the presentation of grace. We see the presentation of the Holy Spirit taking up residence and bringing salvation and regeneration on a sovereign, on, on a sovereign scale into the heart of man. This, is, this was not a New Testament concept. This is an Old Testament concept. So let me show it to you. In the book of Jeremiah, and remember when we were talking about doctrinal dependence earlier when we were, we were comparing the New Testament with the book of Ecclesiastes? Well, here clearly we find that again here in the book of Jeremiah. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 15, I want you to see this with me. It says, and thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 17 and 18, look at what it says. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, and Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because there were no more. Then later on, we see in Jeremiah, turn your Bibles to Jeremiah, and in chapter 31, we read that famous passage, that well-known passage in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, 31, 32, 33, and 34. Here's what we read. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Verse 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart, and I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, it says, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. We find 
that the writer of the book of Hebrews goes back now and quotes directly out of the book of Jeremiah, thus giving it its veracity, its authentic, uh, authentication, okay? We see this very clearly here. We see in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8, all the way down to verse 12, for finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. Boy, you never want to hear those words. And then in verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You see this very clearly here. He also later on in Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, we see in verse 15 to 17, And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, look what he says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart. He says, and on their mind I will write them. And he, then he says, and their sins and their lawlessness deeds and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Then we get to the book of Lamentations. And in Lamentations, it's alluded to. The book of Lamentations is alluded to in the book of Matthew in chapter 27. We see in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 30, this is what it says in Lamentations chapter 3 verse 30. It says, let him give his, give his cheek to the smiter, let him be filled with reproach. We see this concept is laid out again in Matthew chapter 27 verse 30. We understand, remember, at the crucifixion, and it says, and they spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. And we see that clearly there. The book of Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel, this book is not clearly cited or quoted in the New Testament, but Jesus questions to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 implies that Nicodemus should have known about the new birth on the basis of the book of Ezekiel since he was a teacher of the word of God. Now, and we see this in Ezekiel chapter 36, 25 in this conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus. And it says in Ezekiel 36, 25, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all the filthiness and from all your idols. Now, we see in John 3, 10, where Jesus, you have to remember, you have to read the whole passage, the whole paragraph where this conversation is taking place. And in John 3, 10, Jesus answered and said to them, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? And this is precisely what Jesus was talking about. Further, Paul, you see the Apostle Paul felt morally bound by Ezekiel's warning that he gives in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 8, not to be guilty of what? Not to be guilty of the blood of the wicked. And we see that in Acts chapter 20, verse 26. So let's put these two verses together. We see in Ezekiel 33, 8, it says, And when I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to one, and he says, you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. Now we see Paul uses the same admonition, and we see how he uses it in Acts chapter 20 and verse 26, where he says, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. So we see a, clear, a, a very clear description and reference back to the book of Ezekiel. In addition, there are some possible allusions also in, um, in Ezekiel later on. And we see this as we compare Ezekiel chapter 47 with verse 1 and John, the book of John chapter 7 verse 38. And we see this here where he says in Ezekiel 47 1, Then he brought me back to the door of the house and behold, water. Water was flowing from under the threshold of the house toward the east. Just mark that passage there. For the house faced east, and the water was flowing down from under and from the right side of the house from the south to the altar. 
you recall in that whole dialogue in John chapter 7, where it says this, and he who believes in me as the scripture said, this is back, a reference back to this, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. We see it in Isaiah as well in chapter 58. In Isaiah chapter 58, we see this in verse 11 where it says, and the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones and you will be like a water garden and like a spring, mark this, and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Ezekiel 18.20, a well-known passage, uh, really is tied together with Paul in the book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. You know these passages well, but let me remind you of them. It says in Ezekiel 18.20, the person who sins will die. That's very clear. The son will not bear the punishment of the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment of the son's iniquity, and the righteous of the righteous, he says very clearly here, he says, will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. But in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, which we all know that famous passage, again, let me remind you, Ezekiel 18, 18 20 begins this way. It says, the person who sins will die. Paul says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do not forget that all of the New Testament preachers, the New Testament writers, okay, all of them preach from the Old Testament scripture. That's what they preach from. That was the, and that's how we get the New Testament. So it's inconceivable. Once again, I get on my soapbox. How can you study the New Testament and never spend time in the Old Testament? In Revelation chapter 4, verse 7, undoubtedly comes from Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, I, I don't think there's any doubt about this. We see this in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10, where he says, And as for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right, and on the face of a bull on the left, and the, all four had the face of an eagle. Now look at this. We see in Revelation chapter 4, verse 7, it says this, The first creature was like a lion, the second creature was like a calf, the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. So we see this very clearly here. Uh, let's look at the book of um, Daniel, the book of Daniel as well. Um, this book also is very clearly identifiable and quoted in the New Testament. Uh, well, let's put Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 together with uh, Daniel chapter 11 verse 31 and Daniel chapter 12 verse 11 and we're going to put that together with Matthew chapter 24 and really Matthew 24 and 25 is the great discussion about the second coming of Jesus Christ which is what the book of Daniel is talking about. Welcome back to lecture 13, part 2, and we left off in the book of Daniel. Let's go, and we're looking at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the book is clearly quoted in the second coming that is discussed extensively in the book of Matthew. <clears throat> we see this in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. But let's look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, and Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. And we're going to look at those, and then we'll jump over into the New Testament, into the book of Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Because this book is clearly quoted. Look what it says, Daniel 9, 27, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of the abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Uh, you, you look at this very clearly. In fact, you can follow this thing all the way into Matthew chapter 24 and into the book of Revelation. 
And I want you to see now Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 11, where it says in verse 31, forces from, when, from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice, and they will set up the abomination of desolation. <clears throat> Remember that phrase? And then look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, and from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days now, I want you to see where now in this great discussion about the second coming with Jesus Christ, we find it in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, where it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, uh, is there any doubt as what's, what's being quoted here? Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. If you don't ever go back to Daniel, you have no idea what he's being discussed here. So we see that Daniel's being verified once again as an inspired book of the Word of God. We see that here in Matthew. Now, in Matthew 24, verse 21 and 30 is a direct quote, and it comes out of Daniel chapter 12, 1 and Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, respectively. So, I want you to see that. Now, since we're in the book of, Dan, uh, of Matthew right now, just stay there for a moment, and go to Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. Let's go backwards this time, and I want you to see this one. In Matthew 24, 21 says, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now underscore that part of the verse, nor ever will. In Daniel chapter 12, let's jump back into Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Look at what it says. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Look at it. Look at it very carefully. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. So we see in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, along with Matthew 24, 21, there will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now. In, Matthew, in Daniel 12, 1, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. This is a direct quotation out of there. And then in Matthew chapter 20, now, so well, since we're in Daniel, let's stay in Daniel for the moment and go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, and this is what it says. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man, one like a son of man was coming. Underscore, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient days and was presented before him. Look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Matthew 24, 30 says, And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So we see the Son of Man will appear in the sky. <clears throat> now let's look at the veracity of the 12 prophets, the remaining prophets. Right? Um, there's just so many of them. So just, just to give you a, just a brief taste of this over and over again, and I am uh, doing this purposely. I am painstakingly taking you through uh, every single book of the Bible. I'm taking you through in the, the Old Testament into the New Testament because I want to drive home the point, the importance of that we comprehend <clears throat> how vital, how critical it is that when we teach and preach the Word of God, the full counsel from the two covenants, that we teach our people to profoundly respect the full counsel of the Word of God, the entire Word of God called the Bible. <clears throat> from the, <clears throat> so we see the books from the Minor Prophets, or the Twelve, are quoted several times in the New Testament. Um, the one that we most know about, that we hear most about, at least in this day of grace and faith, is the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk. So I want you to see this with me <clears throat> and go to um, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by faith. 
the righteous will live by faith. Underscore, but the righteous will live by faith. Mark that there. Now let me take you to the book of Romans in chapter 1, verse 17. The great passage after Romans 16, 16 where Paul makes this proclamation. He says <clears throat> in Romans 1, 17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, remember, as it is written again, but the righteous man shall live by faith. This is a direct quote from the book of Habakkuk in chapter 2, verse 4. We also see again in Galatians, in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 11, along with Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 38. I want you to see this with me. For it is in the right, but for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Then we now we see it repeated in Galatians 3.11. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. Mark that. For the righteous man shall live by faith. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 38, it says this. <clears throat> But my righteous one shall live by faith. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Again, we see a direct correlation in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Since we're in Hebrews, just stay there. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Now just turn over a couple of chapters and look at verse 26. And then we're going to go back into the Old Testament, into the book of Haggai. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 6, and I want you to see this with me. And Hebrews 12, 26 says, And his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. In Haggai, in chapter 2, For thus says the Lord of hosts, One more in a little while. I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. Then we see another small, another uh, prophet, Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, and Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. And we see in Zechariah 13, 7, where it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man. My associate declares the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered. Mark that. Strike the shepherd that my sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. In Matthew 26, verse 31, after this long discourse on the second coming, that's in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew 25, in Matthew 26, this is what we hear. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, for it is written, again, a reference back to the Old Testament, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. So in summary, and this is key, this is really key that you understand this, 22 books of the Hebrew Old Testament, as many as 18 of them, all but Judges, Chronicles, Esther and the Song of Solomon are quoted to or referred to as authoritative in the New Testament. There are New Testament teachings that are directly dependent upon the teachings of those Old Testament books. It should be pointed out that the absence of reference to a specific Old Testament book does not mean that a particular book lacks authority. Instead, it indicates that the New Testament writers had no occasion to refer to it. This is not difficult to understand when a person is asked to recall the last time he quoted from the book of Esther or from the book of Judges. Now, some of the books by their didactic, their didactic or their teaching or devotional nature lead, lend more readily to quotation and hence they are quoted more often than those that lack a didactic nature or are not used in that manner. 
So let's just jump now into another section here. And we're going to talk about the New Testament references to the authority of Old Testament books. So we're just going to run down through this very quickly, very quickly, because I, um, let's see, my, my intent would be to overwhelm you, if you will, to overwhelm you with the, with, with, with the criticalness, the importance Okay? of always keeping the full counsel of the Word of God before yourself and before your people. To only read the New Testament is to read the Bible out of context. Because you wouldn't know what the background information is that the New Testament is constantly referring back to in the Old Testament. So you would only have half the story, which means that you will have a lot of poor application, misapplication, and misrepresentations. Now, some of the Old Testament books that have no distinct reference to their authority do, however, they have a clear commitment to, they have clear commitments to their authenticity. The accompanying chart, which should be, uh, you should have there in front of you in your handouts, it should be in your handouts, it should be in your notes, am I correct? or up on the screen for those who are tuning in from around the world. I want you to see this from the different students that we have from around who are tuning in. I want you to see this with me. Um, we're going to use, uh, let's kind of put it in a chart format <clears throat> and see if this makes sense to you. Um, this accompanying chart indicates some of the more important people in the events of the Old Testament that are verified clearly without any doubt in the New Testament which thereby verifies the authenticity of the books that record them. So uh, we'd have a chart, let's see, on one side we would have, um, so if you're looking at it, on the, on the left side we would have um, um, the Old Testament account of it, and then on the right side we're going to put the scripture in the New Testament where you see this is either talked about, referred to, or verified in any way, in any way shape, or form. Are we together? So on the left side, we have the Old Testament account. In the New Testament, we're just going to just quickly give you the, the scripture references on the right side to the New Testament. So number one, we have the creation of the universe. We see that in Genesis chapter 1. The, we would see this verified in John chapter 1, verse 3. And we would see it verified in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. On uh, number two, we see the creation of Adam and Eve. That would be Genesis chapter 1 and 2 on the left side. On the right, it would be 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 in the New Testament. Number three, the marriage of Adam and Eve. We see that in Genesis chapter 3. And then on the right side, it would be 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. And then number four, we have the temptation of the woman. We see that in Genesis chapter 3. And we see this again delineated um, um, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. And then number five, we have the disobedience, of, uh, the disobedience and the sin of Adam. That's uh, discussed in Genesis chapter 3. We see it discussed openly in Romans chapter 5 verse 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22. Number 6, we have the sacrifices of Abel and Cain, which is discussed in Genesis chapter 4. And we see this discussed again in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4. Number seven, we have the murder of Abel by Cain. That's discussed in Genesis chapter four. And on the right, you will see 1 John chapter three, verse 12. Then we see number eight, it would be the birth of Seth. That's in Genesis chapter four, which is discussed later on in Luke chapter three, verse 38. Then on the left side, we will see the translation of Enoch, he walked with God and walked straight into heaven. That's in Genesis in chapter 5. And we see this once again verified in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 5. Number 10, we have the marriage before the flood. That's in Genesis chapter 6. And we see it verified in the book of Luke in chapter 17, verse 27. And then 
Number 11, we have the flood and the destruction of man. That would be Genesis chapter 7. And on the right side, that would be Matthew chapter 24, verse 39. Uh, number 12, we have the preservation of Noah and his family. That would be the book of Genesis chapter 8 and 9. And then on the right side, you would put there, you would put 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Then we will see number 13, the gene genealogy of Shem, which is discussed in detail in Genesis chapter 10. We see that again in Luke chapter 3, verse 35 and 36. We have the birth of Abraham. Um, we see that discussed in Genesis chapter 11. We see that again discussed in Luke chapter 3, verse 34. Then we have the call of Abraham, that great passage in Abraham, that we see in Genesis chapter 12 and chapter 13. Uh, we see that uh, discussed later on in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. And then we have number 16, the tithes of Melchizedek. The tithes of Melchizedek, you see that discussed in Genesis chapter 14. And then later on, we see it on the right side, that would be Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. And then number uh, 17 is justification of Abraham. That's that great passage that is found in Genesis chapter 15. Um, specifically, it would be 15 verses 1 through 6 uh, in great detail there, and then expound it a little bit further at the remainder of the chapter. And you would see on the right side, that would be Romans chapter 4 verse 3. And then number 18, the whole discussion of Ishmael, that would be in Genesis chapter 16. And we see that verify later on in the New Testament in Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 24. We also have the promise of Isaac, and that would be number 19. And there's a whole discussion in Genesis chapter 17, which is then verified on the right side of your column there in the New Testament. And you see that in Hebrews, okay? You see that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 18. Then number 20 would be Lot and Sodom. That whole story about Lot and Sodom, that's in Genesis chapter 18 and 19 in those two chapters. And we see this discussed later on in the book of Luke in chapter 17 and verse 29. Then number 21 is the birth of Isaac. And that whole discussion takes place in Genesis chapter 21. And then we see it verified in the New Testament okay, in the book of Acts chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. And then we have the offering of Isaac, and that discussion is in Genesis chapter 22, and we see it once again uh, verified here um, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. Then we have the whole story, as you well know, of Moses and the burning bush, and that would be in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, and as you're going down and writing it down into your column, that would be on the right side. That would be Luke chapter 20, verse 32. And then we see the exodus through the Red Sea and that whole discussion in Exodus chapter 14. And we see it once again mentioned um, in, uh, and, and it's noted there in 1 Corinthians in chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Then we continue with the lifting up of the servants in the, uh, I'm sorry, the provision of water and manna, and that is numbered, that it'd be number um, 26, uh, 25, and that'd be Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, uh, verse 17, uh, uh, chapter 17 and verse 6. So you see that discussion in Exodus chapter 17 uh, and 16, and that's later, that, that is discussed later on in chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. And then we have the lifting, the number 26, the lifting up of the serpent in the wilderness in that great passage about healing. And we see that in Numbers chapter 21. And we see later on discussed in John chapter 3, verse 14. And then we have the fall of Jericho. You remember that whole marching around seven times in Jericho. We find that in the book of Joshua, chapter 6, verses 22 to 25. <clears throat> 
and that would be number 27, and you find that discussion later on in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 30. And then we also have number 28, the miracles of Elijah. Um, if you recall those miracles that are discussed in detail in 1 Kings chapter 17 and in 1 Kings chapter 18, um, <clears throat> that's discussed later on by the Apostle James in James chapter 5, verse 17. And then number 29, we have Jonah and the great fish. Um, I know the temptation is to talk about Jonah and the whale, but it's the great fish. And we see that he, and discussed in the book of Jonah in chapter 2. And we see that discussed later on in the book of Matthew in chapter 12, verse 40. And then we have number 30, the three Hebrew youths in the furnace, you know, the, the, you have the three, the, the three uh, friends in the book of Daniel, and that's discussed extensively in Daniel chapter 3, and you will see this later on in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 34, and then we have, in addition to that, in Daniel, the book of Daniel, Daniel and the lion's den, that's in Daniel chapter 6 in great detail, and we see it mentioned again in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33, and then number 32 <clears throat> we get to uh, would be the slain of Zechariah. If you recall, we went into that whole discussion previously about Zechariah. And you remember that uh, the Old Testament, and one of the phrases for knowing the Old Testament is from the death of Abel to Zechariah. The first death is Abel. The last death, it would be Zechariah. So that's a reference, a euphemism for using the word Old Testament. And we see that in the book of Matthew as well. And we see that in Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, and the whole story, the death of Zechariah in 2 Chronicles in chapter 24, verses 20, and so forth. So you begin to see how this, how all of this comes together synergistically, if you will. Welcome back to our class. This is uh, Lecture 13, Part 3. Now, we have been talking about the Old Testament for now 12 full weeks, or about 12 and a half weeks, roughly. We now enter into the realm, into the world of the New Testament. We're going to look at the specific claims for inspiration of the New Testament. And now that that claim in, now that the claim is in and for the inspiration of the Old Testament has been examined, and I believe we should be convinced by now of the New Testament claim is needed in order to complete the proposition that the Bible as a whole, both the Old and the New, claims to be the authoritative Word of God. You would think that this should be a counterintuitive issue but it is not. We still have people, I'm talking about inside the church, who still, for reasons that I do not understand, okay, deny the authority of the Word of God. And they're in a church. Does that make any sense to you? It does not make any sense to me. <laughs> so the testimony of the New Testament to its own inspiration begins with the words of Christ himself. He is the central figure of the New Testament. So here's what we want to do, because in a real sense, Christ, he is the key to the inspiration and the canonization of the scriptures, plural, and it was he who confirmed the inspiration of the Hebrew canon of the Old Testament, and it is he who promised the Holy Spirit would direct the apostles into all truths, the fulfillment resulting in the New Testament. It was he who said that he not come to nullify the law, to abrogate the law, to destroy the law, to kill the law, but to fulfill the law. He said that very clearly. So these are his words, and he's, he alone, as the Lagos, okay, as the living word himself, he stands okay, on the pinnacle of authority of the word of God. <clears throat> now, Jesus Christ, he promised that the New Testament writers would, in fact, be spirit-directed. This is a distinction from the Old 
Testament, and both, both the Old and New were directed by the Spirit, but Jesus Christ makes a distinct remark with regard to that issue in the New Testament. Jesus, Jesus himself did not commit his teaching to writing, but on several occasions during his earthly ministry, he did promise that the apostles would be directed by the Holy Spirit in the utterance and the propagation of his teaching. This promise was fulfilled during the life of Christ and then later on extended well into the post-resurrection era and the post-Pentecostal ministries of the apostles. So here's one of the first things we're going to be looking at is guidance in preaching. Guidance in preaching. First, Jesus promised the guidance of the Holy Spirit in what the apostles would speak about him. And I have about six minor points that I want to address under this issue of guidance in preaching and that he would be and that the apostles would be directed by the Holy Spirit to talk and to teach about him, him being Christ. The first one, number one, is this. And turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew in chapter 10. And I want you to see this with me in Matthew chapter 10. And let's go down to verse 5. And let's work our way down through, oh, let's see, down to verse 15. In Matthew 10 to 15, and the first thing that we have here is that Jesus promised the guidance of the Holy Spirit in what the apostles would, in fact, speak about him. And we discover this when, number one, when, when the 12 were first commissioned okay, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what it says. These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, specifically, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely received freely give, do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey or even two coats or sandals or a staff for the workers worthy of his support. And whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it and stay at his house until you leave that city. And as you enter the house, give it to your greeting. He, he says, if the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it is not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. Whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of the house or the city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than that for that city. So here are the instructions that he gives them, right? And I want you to see this. So this is the background to the instructions that he is giving. And Jesus promised them, this is the disciples, okay, the 12 that he chose. He instructs them, he sends them on the way, but he goes on to make a further promise. And this is what he says to them starting in verse 19. In verse 19. He says, but when they, but when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say. For it will be given you in that hour where you are, what you are to say. He says, for it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Notice this. He promised <clears throat> the disciples. This is now, it, he's, going, he's making the promise to them because there will be a time of a post-resurrection era. And there will be a time of post-Pentecostal era. Right? And he makes a promise to them because these are his disciples. He's already planning to leave this earth. And he said that they were going to be led and they will be guided by the person of the Holy Spirit. He says the same thing more or less in the book of Luke. And in Luke chapter 12, this is what we read in verse 11 and 12. In Luke chapter 12, verse 11 and 12, he says, When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, he says, Do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Let me encourage all of you. All of you who are here with me, all of you who are tuning in by way, of, by way of the screen here, by way of the internet who are tuning in, 
Uh, let me encourage you. If you teach and preach the word of God, the full counsel of the word of God, let me encourage you to spend a significant portion of your time in reading and studying the word of God. Do not worry if you have been taught and been given the proper skills and the training how to exegete a passage, how to exegete a passage, how to conduct yourself and work through the process of hermeneutics, how to arrive at the proper interpretation, how to research, research and dig out what the meaning of the verse, of the whatever verses, selected verses you happen to be teaching on. Okay? Do not be concerned because if you've spent all this time and it is hard work. This is hard work. And let me encourage you. You need to spend a significant time doing this. But when it comes time to deliver, do not worry. I abandon myself, my, myself into the hands of the living God by this promise that he gives here in Luke chapter 12, as well as in Matthew chapter 10 and verses 19 and 20, and Luke chapter 12, verse 11, 12. And verse 12 says, for the Holy Spirit, will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Second point, the same promise was also given to the 70. Remember that? To the 70? Go back now, go to Luke chapter 10. Let me ask you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 10 and go to the very beginning of Luke chapter 10 with me. And let's look at, let's see, um, let's make it the first 10 verses. Luke chapter 10. And let's work down through the first 10 verses. No, make that 12 verses. Let's go to the end of that section. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. So they are the precursors. And he says, and he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into, the, into his harvest harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. Verse 5, <clears throat> whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him, but if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house eating and drinking what they give you. The labor is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you and heal those in it who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they, did, and, and they enter and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet, wipe off in protest against you and be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. Verse 12, and I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. <clears throat> I'm reminded here in Luke chapter 10 as a sidebar, as a side, as a side note, when he says in Luke chapter 10 and verse 8, whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Um, let, me say, let me say to you that I have practiced that faithfully <clears throat> in all the many, many, many years now that I have traveled extensively in, in all kinds of countries, in all kinds of settings, and I had number one rule for me all the time. Number one rule. I have no idea where I even, how, even, how I even came up with the rule. I, I just, I'm, at the moment I don't remember. But I do know that this verse clearly makes that statement. And this was this. Wherever I, and I've eaten in the jungles in Africa. I've been in so many different countries in Africa alone in that continent. And all over Latin America. Let me tell you something. I've been into Asia and I've been in the Middle East. And let me tell you. My number one rule that's worked for me for many, 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 many years is simple. Do not ask, do not tell me what I'm eating. And I just eat it. In, in the end, <clears throat> by the time they cook it, uh, let me tell you, in the end, uh, most of it tastes like chicken <laughs> by the end, okay? I can tell you that right now. And that rule worked for me fantastic. It was a great rule. It worked for me for many, many, many years. Then a number of years ago, I was in the country of Mozambique. <clears throat> no, I'm sorry, in Madagascar. And um, it's true what they say about Madagascar. It's a big island in, in, the, in the continent of Africa off the southeast coast of uh, the African continent. <clears throat> and um, uh, the, 
the uh, village chief, he had learned to pray, and he had insisted that uh, he pray, he would lead in prayer, and you know, this is now my second time back there, and he wanted really to impress me with the fact that he learned how to pray, and he wanted to lead the prayer just as we sat down to eat, and they set up a long table, and we sat there, and <clears throat> getting prepared, and we held hands, and, and the village chief b b proceeded to lead us in prayer, and he had his servants, and he had the cooks at the end of the table, and so we bowed our heads in the, in the village streets. He led in prayer, and he finished praying. And just as he said, amen, open up my, I opened my eyes, and on my plate, which is not, the best way I know how to describe it to you, was that on my plate was these, um, what looked like two big, big, big potatoes, except that they were covered in what looked like a cream sauce of some kind. And I said, wow, look at that. <clears throat> so when we bowed our heads to pray, and I, I saw it, and I looked at it, and I said, hmm, Looked like two big potatoes. Great. So we prayed, and so I opened my eyes as the, as the village, said, the village chief said, Amen. And all of a sudden, I see the, again, my version, I thought these were two big potatoes. All of a sudden, I see the two big, big potatoes. They shook themselves off. The sauce goes flying, and they walked right off my plate. So, Rule number one, never tell me what I eat, worked for me for many, 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 many years. I now have two rules. <laughs> and the second one is, okay, it cannot walk off my plate. It has to be dead. Okay? So now I sit down when a village chief wants to say he wants to pray. I've got the fork in one hand. I got a knife in the other hand. I got him turned around, and I'm praying, and I'm going to pray and watch. Because mm -hmm. if this thing moves, it's dead. It is absolutely dead. So I want you to understand that that was biblical because it says here in Luke 10, 8, whatever city you enter, they receive you, eat what is set before you. Just saying, just saying, just saying. Let's go back. <clears throat> so now, second thing, number two. The same promise was also given to the 70 here that we see here when Jesus authorized them and he was authorizing them to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that the kingdom of God is coming. And he added this section <clears throat> and down, down, we read down to verse 12. Now drop down to verse 16 and look at verse 16 because he, now he's adding this confirmation. And he says in Luke 10, 16, he says, the one who listens to you listens to me and the one who rejects you rejects me and the one who rejects me rejects the one who sent me you see that the one who listens to me listens to me and the one who rejects you re rejects me and the one who rejects me rejects the one who sent me so what he's saying is that it's the Holy Spirit who's speaking and that's what they're doing number three go to Mark chapter 13 in Mark chapter 13 and look with me there and I want you to see this in Mark 13 here again is another situation where Jesus Christ makes this affirmation and go to Mark chapter 13 and go down to where it says start on verse 9 Mark 13 verse 9 and let's read from 9 to 13. We're in Mark chapter 13, and it says, But be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. And then look at what he says here in verse 11. And when they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Go with me to John chapter 14 now. Go to John chapter 14 and see this with me as well. In John chapter 14, and I want to draw your attention down to verse 25 toward the end of this chapter. And let's look at verses 25 to 31. And here's the third, the fourth point that I want to make with you, okay? And that is that later on, after the Lord's Supper, okay, 
the Last Supper, Jesus further elaborated his promise to the eleven. And what is that? That the Holy Spirit will direct them and give them the utterance that they require. So in John chapter 14, we see this starting in verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said. You see that very clearly here. Okay? So if you're going to teach and preach the full counsel of the Word of God, and Jesus makes the promise that the Holy Spirit will give us the guidance, okay, to provide forth the utterance of what we're to say, again, this is the reason why I made the statement at the outset. You need to spend the significant portion of your time in studying and reading the Word of God. So when it comes time to deliver the Word of God, you do not have to worry. The Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you because the Holy Spirit cannot be divorced from the Word of God. We also see the same situation here in John chapter 16. Just turn over two chapters and look at John chapter 16, and look what he says in verse 12. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Note the key in verse 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, talking about the person of the Holy Spirit, comes, he will guide you into all what? into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he, he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. Again, the promise by Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us in the teaching and the preaching and the full counsel of the Word of God. Then in Luke chapter 24, go back to Luke, and look at me in Luke chapter 24 as well, and at the end of this uh, book in chapter 24. Look with me down and go down toward the end of that chapter. Go down and look at uh, 44. 44. And here is the, here's the presentation of the Great Commission in the book of Luke. And he says this, it was now about the sixth hour. No. Let's uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Look what he says in Luke 24, 44. And now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prospect and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Here, what was he opening his mind to? That they would understand the Old Testament. And he said to them, thus it is written, again, another reference to the Old Testament, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead in the third day. So here we have a situation where Jesus Christ is making this promise to us. He's very clear about that. He does not deny that, that we will have to work at this, but he gives us the promise in Matthew chapter 10. He gives us the promise in Luke chapter 12. He gives us the promise in Luke chapter 10. He gives us the promise in Mark chapter 13. He gives us the promise in John chapter 14, in John chapter 16, and he gives us the promise in Luke chapter 24. We see this very clearly here. And at the end of this discourse in Luke 24, look what he says in verse 49. And behold, I am sending forth what? The promise of my Father upon you, and you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He's making, talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. So this very commission was recorded by Matthew in the following words when he said this in Matthew 28, 20, which is at the end of the Great Commission, and he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Thus, the apostles were again promised the presence of God and through that preaching and through their preaching and their teaching. And we see finally number six, just prior to his ascension, Jesus answered the disciples' inquiry about the future with the promise. And this is what he said to them in the book of Acts chapter one. And look with me in verse six, seven, and eight. And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of, to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But he does say this in eight. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come 
upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Now notice why you receive the power and why you receive the Holy Spirit, so that you will be witnesses both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So we are to be his witnesses, his mouthpiece in teaching and proclaiming the full counsel of the word of God, that the kingdom of hand is at hand, the kingdom of God is at hand, and that the Holy Spirit would empower them in their witness about Christ was their assurance and we have that same assurance today there is absolutely no reason why that we should have to worry or be concerned if we take the time to spend time in his word